Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Hill, Texas history teacher for Team Michigan State at Owsley Junior High School. And today we're going to do something um, kind of neat, something a little different uh, from what we're used to doing with um, uh, the note taking and such. Today we're going to analyze a painting. Now, when I say we're going to analyze a painting, we're going to take a look at it. We're going to break it down into nine different pieces. We're going to analyze each one of those pieces. And the reason we do that is <clears throat> a lot of times when a painter or an artist creates a work of art, um, they're not necessarily just doing it to create something pretty or attractive or cool. Um, they're putting some sort of um, meaning behind it, whether that's a has social meaning um, uh, or or political meaning. Um, they're trying to put a, an idea behind their work. And the painting that we're going to look at today is a perfect example of a painting that has a definite meaning behind it. So we're going to take a look at it today and we're going to break it down break it apart, and hopefully understand not only more about the painting itself, but the overall concept that the painting represents. Now, the painting that we're going to study today represents a concept that um, we're going to be talking a lot about this unit, and that concept is Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was the belief by Americans in the middle of the 1800s that the United States had the right to expand its borders from where it began in the east at the Atlantic Ocean all the way west to the Pacific Ocean. That the United States had the right to transverse the entire continent and to take control of it. Now here's how Manifest Destiny ended up playing out. <clears throat> uh, and this will give you a good idea about what we're talking about, about spreading from the east to the west. Um, when England founded the original 13 colonies, um, they were along the eastern seaboard, what we call uh, the east coast. Uh, those 13 colonies um, in 1776, they declared independence from England. So that was where we started, okay? Then in 1776, when we declared independence from England, we went to war with England, and we won the Revolutionary War. And as a result, the treaty that the new United States signed with England that ended the war also gave the United States the other lands in North America or in yeah, sort of in North America, that England owned. So in 1783, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the United States doubled in size from those original 13 colonies westward, uh, basically including all the land that is today um, uh, uh, Ohio, uh, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Kentucky, um, and Tennessee, Wisconsin, Michigan. So doubled in size, 1783. Then, as we learned earlier this year, in 1803, Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, purchased the Louisiana Territory from France. So now the United States basically doubles in size again in 1803. Then, in 1819, the United States, whoops, <laughs> the United States signed a treaty with Spain that gave the United States Florida. It was known as the Adams Onus Treaty. Then, when we were talking about the Texas Revolution and the Republic of Texas, we know that Texas, the people of Texas, wanted very badly to become part of the United States. And in 1845, Texas was annexed by the United States. Then the following year, in 1846, 
we gained the Oregon Territory in a treaty with England. England had uh, claimed that this territory that includes Washington State and Oregon um, and Idaho, they claimed that that was theirs. Uh, the United States claimed that it was part of the Louisiana Purchase. And then finally, in 1846, it was all taken care of and it became part of the United States. Then, as we're about to learn here in the next couple weeks, uh, Texas, I'm sorry, not Texas, the United States grew even more in 1848 by gaining what we call the Mexican Cession, land that Mexico uh, quote unquote sold to the United States after the U.S.-Mexican War. And then finally, in 1853, the United States was complete, or at least the continental United States was complete when the U.S. purchased from Mexico what is known as the Gadsden Purchase. So, as you can see, <clears throat> we moved from the East Coast all the way across the West Coast until we controlled all of what is referred to now as the continental United States, the United States that is contained on the North American continent. So we're going to look at this painting today. The painting is titled American Progress. It's by an American artist named John Gast. And it is a painting that has come to represent or to symbolize the concept of manifest destiny. So here are our instructions. Here's what you're going to be doing today. If you're in class, you are going to get a piece of paper that has this on the front and another little section on the back. If you're virtual learning, you're going to uh, make a copy of this in Google Docs. Okay, so your instructions um, are pretty simple, actually. Uh, on the front here, we have nine boxes. The painting that we're going to look at is going to be divided into nine different boxes. And you're going to use this page either on paper, in class, or in Google Docs if you're doing it virtual. As each piece of the painting is revealed, because each piece is hidden behind a box, as each piece is revealed, you will write or type everything that you see in that box. You'll write it or type it in the corresponding box to the box that you're going to be revealing, we're going to be revealing in this video. When the full painting is revealed, you will use this sheet to write a summary of what you think this painting represents. Make sure you study the imagery in each box carefully. Some imagery, in other words, people, animals, etc., are in more than one box. Remember, when you're analyzing a painting, no detail is too big and no detail is too small. So look at everything. Okay, first off, let's start by uh, discussing this. Who or what is Colombia? You guys have heard that before, Colombia. Uh, there's a country in South America or Central America called Colombia. And we've heard Colomb, Colum, where have we heard that before? Col Col Columbus, Columbus. Colombia is named for, of course, Christopher Columbus. So, we all know who Uncle Sam is, right? Uncle Sam, the representation of the United States, the uh, tall, thin man wearing the, the blue tuxedo looking jacket, um, uh, the, uh, the, the top hat with the uh, stars and stri or, uh, stars uh, uh, headband on it. Uh, I think he usually has um, uh, red and white striped pants. And he is the personification of the United States. Uh, when we talk about personifications, when you take an idea and you try to put that idea into human form, um, Uncle Sam is the human representation of the United States. Now, honestly, Uncle Sam is Uncle Sam is usually used in context with the United States government. But when we're talking about the concept of the United States and trying to put a personification on it, back before there was ever an Uncle Sam. There was someone named Columbia. Columbia was the personification of America before Uncle Sam. Uh, 
And she's taken many forms over the years. Uh, usually she is a blonde haired woman uh, wearing a long flowing robe. Uh, she generally has some type of uh, white robe or, or maybe it's uh, stars and stripes. Uh, she's always, almost always going to have some form of, uh, of red, white, and blue on her. Um, she is going to be carrying a sword a lot of times. Uh, she's going to be carrying an olive branch representing peace, and she will almost always have, either on her forehead or floating over her head, a star. Uh, now, uh, two really good examples of Columbia that you may not even realize are Columbia. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie that comes from Columbia Studios. Uh, at the very beginning, it shows a woman standing on a pedestal and she's holding a torch above her head. Uh, that is a representation, a representation of Columbia, Columbia Pictures, duh. Um, and then probably the most famous version of Columbia that there is, is the Statue of Liberty. That's right, the Statue of Liberty, she has a name and she is, Columbia. Okay, so here we go. We have nine boxes. Those boxes correspond to the nine boxes on the notes that you've been provided. Okay, so let's take a look at the first part of our image. We're looking in the upper left corner, box number one. And what we see here are clouds. We see dark, ominous, stormy looking clouds uh, over what appears to be uh, snowy, cold, icy, jagged mountain tops, mountain peaks. Okay. Box number two we see a woman. Now, in the past, if I would have asked my students, hey, who do you think this woman is? They would have said, an angel, because obviously she has a white gown on, a flowing robe. Um, the wind is, is blowing the, the flowing robe. It's making it look almost like wings on an angel. She has long golden tresses with a gold star above her forehead. And in her right hand, she is clutching a book that says, oddly enough, school book. Now, what do you think a school book represents? Maybe, I don't know, education, learning. Now, notice the difference between the sky behind Columbia and the sky in box number one not quite as dark and stormy and ominous. In fact, as it moves from left to right, it looks like it's getting a little lighter and brighter. So then we go to box number three. Oh my goodness, the, the storm clouds. There, there's almost no storm clouds. There's just wisps of clouds left. And you see in the, the far, on the far right, you see the sun rising over the horizon. Uh, you see rays of light, warm sunshine. And instead of those jagged mountains, we now see gently soft rolling hills. Box number four. Oh my goodness. We see herds of buffalo and we see people down here that look like uh, uh, Native Americans. They look like Indians in the uh, in the distance there at the foot of those mountains, um, you see herds of, uh, a herd of wild animals. And way off in the distance, it looks like a wagon being pulled by horses. And then here in the foreground, at the very front, of course, right behind the Indians, we see what looks like oxen. Uh, and they have, um, they have a harness on them, like they're maybe pulling something. What could they be pulling? Let's see the next part. Of our painting. <gasps> They're pulling a wagon. Oh my goodness. They're pulling a wagon in the distance. We see the rest of that wagon train, the horses pulling those wagons. We see an Indian village. The Indians are dancing and, and uh, doing all this stuff. And, and what's this guy here? This, uh, this guy on this horse. Oh my gosh. Have you guys ever heard of a Pony Express rider? Yeah, the Pony Express was how mail 
uh, was sent uh, on the frontier. They would have a, a rider who would carry a pouch full of mail and he would ride on a horseback and he would ride for many miles um, to, uh, to deliver mail. And of course, we also see the middle half, the lower half of Columbia herself. Um, she has um, wrapped around that right arm if you remember the right arm that is carrying the uh, the school book, you also see that she has looped around that arm. She has some sort of wire or rope. Uh, oh, okay, it's a wire. It's not a rope. Okay, and uh, she's holding it in her left hand as well as she as she moves along. And moving on to the next part of our picture, where that wire is coming out of her hand. It's being threaded along on poles. It's a telegraph wire. And of course, this painting is so old, it predates telephones. So communication was done using a telegraph. So you can also see in the background, um, you can see in the distance um, what looks like a, a, a bay or a harbor of some sort. You see ships. You see a bridge in the distance. You see train tracks, you see trains, um, you see uh, transportation. We see a stagecoach down in the lower left corner. And in the lower right corner, we see a log cabin built on the frontier. Box number seven. Here we see the lower half of those Indians. Um, one of the horses is pulling something called a travois which was uh, their form of uh, moving things from one place to another. It was two long poles um, that were used to uh, lash their, their teepees, their homes. Uh, sometimes the old people or the children would ride on it. Um, you see a, uh, a bear turned around looking upward, because you can kind of see that he's, he's looking upward. What do you think he's looking at? What's been floating there across the middle of our screen? Oh, that's right. It's Columbia. It's America. It's progress. And the bear is, is kind of running away. What are the Indians doing? They're running away too, right? All right. Box number eight. We see a group of workers. Uh, they're carrying tools and it looks like they're on a road. Maybe they're trailblazers. Maybe they are the ones who are making the road. Maybe they're moving from the east to the west, and as they go, they're building roads. And then, oops, I kind of jumped ahead there. And then in the final box, number nine, we see two farmers. Um, we see oxen pulling a plow, turning the earth to plant seeds. We see a fence um, we see uh, some trees, uh, a creek with a, a wild deer running along. So we see settlement. We see people moving and settling in towns and, and farms and ranches and these things. So those are the nine boxes. Let's take a look at the entire picture now. Uh, so there we have it. Notice how the left half of the picture is dark and stormy and cloudy and jagged peaks and cold and dangerous and wild Indians and wild animals. And, and then here in the center, you have Columbia. Columbia is moving westward and everywhere she's going is wild and primitive and uncivilized. And everywhere she's been is warm and, and it's civilized and it's, um, progress and technology and communication and transportation and and towns and settlements and so you, you kind of get the idea where Columbia has been where America has been it's civilized where America is going it's primitive so thinking about those things let's take a look at our first little bit of notes here. Actually, these aren't notes. These are just some ideas here. So the West, the Pacific Ocean, the East, the Atlantic Ocean, Columbia, America, progress, the flowing white robe, as I said, angelic, dark, cloudy, stormy, cold, snowy, jagged peaks, 
To the east, we have bright, clear skies and sunrise, green, rolling hills, warmth. The west, primitive and dangerous. And the east, civilized and safe. Columbia carries with her a school book representing education. She carries telegraph wires representing communication. In the east, we see where Columbia has been. We see commerce. We see trade. We see an economy. We see trains and ships, which equal technology and innovation. We see telegraph, which represents communication. In the west, we see wild animals fleeing. We see Indians fleeing or being forced off their land. To the east, we see settlements and towns. We see transportation. We see farming, domesticated animals, blazing trails, workers, and roads. So, hopefully that will help you fill in your notes a little bit. All right. So, this is the back of the, uh, the paper notes, uh, the second page of the Google Doc. Uh, and what you're going to do is you're going to answer these next two questions, looking at the next two slides, and then you're going to write down the notes at the very end. So our first question, what is the overall feeling of this half of the painting? Okay. What is the overall feeling? What is the tone of this image that you see here. What is being represented? All right. What is the overall feeling of this half of the painting? Once again, what is being represented? What's your impression of this side of the photo uh, of the, the painting? All right. And then that takes us to the last part, our little bit of notes that you need to write. What was Manifest Destiny? Manifest Destiny was the belief that the United States had the right to expand from east to the west. That Americans believed it was God's will that the U.S. spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, well, that is it for Manifest Destiny. Um, Manifest Destiny has taken a really bad rap um, over the last 20 years or so. Uh, people look now at, and they, they look at Manifest Destiny, and they can't really see anything other than genocide. Uh, that is when people kill other people. They see the American push for Manifest Destiny uh, to control the continent. They see that as um, uh, the people in the East eastern part of the United States, the United States government wanting to eradicate and wipe out the Native American population and anyone who lived in the western part of the United States. Now, of course, that would have included um, the people of French ancestry who lived along the Mississippi River. It would have included uh, the Mexican people who lived in Texas and who lived in the southeast, I'm sorry, southwest part of the United States. So, uh, like I said, Manifest Destiny allowed our country to expand from one side of the nation to the other, it made our country um, what our country is today. Uh, but does that mean that it was good? Uh, probably not, especially if you were a person who lived in the western part of the United States that was forced off your land or, or that was killed. Uh, but we can't do anything about that. All we can do is look at the mistakes that were made and hope that in the future we don't make those mistakes again. So that being said, that is it for our um, uh, painting analysis. I uh, hope that you enjoyed this. I hope that you learned a little bit of something. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Manifest Destiny over the next uh, week or so. So um, that's about it. Save those notes. And until next time, I'll talk to you later.